would love for you guys just to kind of um, briefly talk about what you've been doing, your roles at your companies, um, and then I'll jump in with um, our heated debate, hopefully. So Julie, if you want to start. Okay, just to give a, an overview um, of what Ariadne Capital is about, I set it up after I sold First Tuesday, which was a network of entrepreneurs, and really to do one thing, I felt that there were great entrepreneurs all over Europe um, that really needed to be married with other entrepreneurs who had kind of gone into the burning building of setting up a startup and made it through to the other side, and this model of entrepreneurs backing entrepreneurs was inevitable. So we aggregated the capital of 60 entrepreneurs, leading tech entrepreneurs and private equity people, and we started backing um, entrepreneurs, and some of the companies we've been associated with either as an advisor or investor over the past 12 and a half years have been monetized Skype, Spinvox, eSpotting, Zopa, Beat That Quote, and so forth. So today Ariadne has its own fund. It's a seed fund to back early stage companies, people like Quill and Tagstar, et cetera. We raise capital for later stage funder, funding rounds and so forth. We also have something called Entrepreneur Country because we believe that the world is going to Entrepreneur Country. Most of us in this room will understand what that means. Structural change, social contract has, has changed. We're taking Entrepreneur Country now to the world because we feel that corporates are the missing piece of the, the corporate startup connection. We're building the digital cars, but they need a highway. They need corporates that are going to open themselves up and help them go to the world. So Entrepreneur Country is going global, and then we have something called Startup Village. Um, so I work for Silicon Valley Bank, and um, basically our DNA is from Silicon Valley, so we do what we say on the box. And essentially what we do is we focus on um, banking and financing and lending to uh, technology companies at all stages of growth. So I'm working with the accelerator, which is very early stage, but obviously we'll work with growth and big corporates. Um, the the uh, bank was founded about 30 years ago in the Valley, but actually we're one of the newest banks in Great Britain. So we actually only received our UK banking license about a year ago. Um, and you know we're here, we believe there's a really interesting market. And you know we're here to start working with some of the largest companies, um, sort of, in the UK. And then I just came on board about four months ago to launch the accelerator, which is really focused on working with seed funds, accelerators, um, earlier stage companies, and and working with them as a bank and seeing them grow. And then I think the final thing is we work very closely with venture capital funds, PE funds. Um, again, we work with them, bank with them, and lend to them. So we're we're 100% focused on the technology ecosystem. We know tech, we love tech, and that's all we believe in, so. Uh, hi, everyone, I'm Saul, I'm partner at Index Ventures. Uh, we're an early stage uh, tech fund. Um, we have probably about 120 active investments in tech in 39 cities, in 20 different countries, uh, out of three offices. And if you were around this morning, people were talking about uh, companies getting big out of Europe. Um, when we've sort of recently looked at just our portfolio, there were, I think, 37 private companies in our portfolio born in Europe that last year combined did four billion pounds in revenue uh, with an average growth rate of 75%. Uh, they created over 10,000 new jobs in the last 10 years and have about 1,000 uh, job openings. So, you know, we see uh, the ecosystem in which we're lucky enough to invest from Israel all the way through to Silicon Valley being very, very vibrant um, and huge amount of opportunity. Um, about well, in 2007, I also started Seed Camp with uh, my partner Reshma Sahoni. Um, and the idea behind Seed Camp, which you know, many of us are now familiar with, you know, given the success that Y Combinator has had in the US and now Techstars uh, in the US and, and coming to London, is that you know, for first time entrepreneurs in particular, um, particularly in very fragmented ecosystems like Europe, where historically it was even hard to get people from London and Cambridge to talk to one another, never mind from London to Madrid, um, to actually give people a, a kickstart uh, or an Indiegogo, um, you know, is a huge, huge uh, uh, way of getting uh, more people into the ecosystem. And, um, you know, we're just really excited to be uh, in, in this space, and I think you know, London 
is more than having its moment, as witnessed by all of the uh, Commonwealth accents on this stage. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. My name is John Bradford. Um, I'm, I'm extremely fortunate. I've got the best job in the world, or I think I've got the best job in the world. Um, but uh, second of all, I've been very fortunate to be inspired by help by a number of different people, including the work that Saul's just described. Saul um, set up the first accelerator in Europe, I think, in 2007. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and about three years into that, um, I decided that um, I could kind of put my effort into that and help as well. My second moment of luck was I happened to bump into a guy called David Cohen, who had set up Techstars about the same time as SIGCAMP in the US, which was based around uh, bringing the community together through mentorship to help support early stage teams. Um, and David was kind enough to help me set up what was originally called Springboard. Um, as I described, or as my wife now describes, three and a half years later, he eventually got round to offering me a job um, and, and helped set up Techstars London. Um, I think what's probably more interesting than that is the fact that Techstars up to this point have only operated out of the US market and currently have nine programs in operation there. Uh, and London represents its very first international foray um, because they believe that there genuinely is something interesting in the water today. And there is, a, a, I think somebody described, a golden, golden moment in London today where teams and talent and money are slowly come blending together uh, to create real opportunities. And actually people um, have the ambition to not just be big in the UK or Europe, but actually to create real global opportunities for themselves. Thanks, guys. Um, and you and Solbo said, you know, London's having this kind of golden moment right now. Um, what do you guys think is the state of the London tech startup ecosystem? Is it something that's emerging still? Is it um, something that is, you know, overhyped? Um, I mean, what do you guys think? Well, you know, just as a minor um, data point or anecdote, you know, we all saw that Shazam received 40 million of funding from Carlos Slim um, the other day. And uh, I just happened because I know Keith, their CFO, and, and so I kind of knew ahead of that, and I just kind of tweeted out, you know, well done, Shazam, for that. And I, I, I was fascinated that I got hit with this avalanche of, because I said it was a great British success story. And people, oh, no, it's not British, Julie, it's American. And I thought... Okay, right. Even when it is British and even when it's a British success story, some people want to keep on saying, oh, it must have come from America. And I find that to be um, unhelpful. The, the simple fact of the matter is for people, I grew up in Palo Alto. If I wanted to go there, I could. That's where everybody I know kind of lives. Um, London is amazing because you have all the talent and less of the ego. When I go home to Palo Alto now, I just want to say to all my friends and cousins and so forth, shut up, stop talking about yourself, right? Could you just get on with building your business and so forth? So, you know, Americans are taught on day two of their life to broadcast to the world what they think. And we think that the world wants to hear what we say, but it doesn't, right? And so actually, I think what's lovely about being here is that we have that London is the center of the Anglosphere. And for people who are immigrants, because that, that's what I am, we choose to live here, is because we see this massive market out of London and it's so way cool. I don't want to go to Palo Alto. I don't want to overpay for companies. And I just want to build solid, sustainable businesses here. And it's, and it's happening. It's not emerging. It, it's here. And the only thing that's going to hold us back is if we keep on saying, well, Shazam gets $40 million, oh, it must be an American company. It's not. It's British. Um, <clears throat> I think I've been around since uh, day one with Saul um, at the launch of Seed Camp. And back then, I was at Microsoft. And we launched our startup program in 2008. And you know, I'm very positive. The kind of growth I've seen over the last five years is just incredible. And um, there's an article that Mike Butcher just wrote in TechCrunch a while back, and it just sort of chronicles the history of 2007 to 2013. And you think about, um, for me, a couple of things. All the big corporates that are getting involved in the startup ecosystem. So, you know, Microsoft was in 2008. Um, IBM launched their startup program in 2010. Google opened campus last year, 
uh, Amazon is doing their you know, startup program, and every single day in my role at the bank, I'm meeting um, quite a few corporate innovation arms that are looking at how do we do startup programs. I forgot to mention Telefonica launching Wira late last year, or early last year. Um, and then I think the final comment to make about London being positive, Silicon Valley Bank decided to open up their first international branch in London. And it, it's not easy to get a banking license in Great Britain. You know, it took us um, two and a half years of discussions and negotiation with the FSA to get that. But we believe there is a real marketplace. And I think the final thing I'll say is, in a lot of ways, London is the gateway to the rest of Europe. And, and you think about um, the existence of now organizations like UKTI and Tech City, that's what they're here to do, is try to make London the gateway. So I'm very, very positive. And, um, you know, I'm very positive. We're positive enough to leave an old job to this new job in the bank and work on building, you know, a new business because we believe so strongly there's an opportunity. So. Same question or different one? <laughs> well, I mean, I think we talked about this the other week. Um, I mean, it seems like you guys don't think it's an emerging market. It's, you know, maybe even a matured market right now. There's, are the company's valuations going up? You know, is it in that kind of growth of the ecosystem? I mean, you know, one of the things I, we, we discussed, uh, and I think, you know, it's, we have an office in San Francisco, we have an office in London, so it's interesting on a weekly basis to sort of hear the two, the two ecosystems in, in real time. And, you know, there's definitely, as Julie said, a difference in attitude, sometimes a, a very healthy difference in attitude, I would say, because I think, you know, having spent two out of the last three years in Israel and having spent five or six years in the 90s in the US, I think, you know, one of the things that we still miss in this ecosystem, not just in London, but in, in Europe, is attitude. Um, and, you know, it's a mixture of sort of aggression and just attitude. And sometimes there is too much attitude in the US, and there's definitely sometimes too much attitude in Israel. But, I mean, I think we have the raw materials. When I look at, you know, in 93, when I started in this industry at the Telegraph, we put the electronic telegraph online the week before the San Jose Mercury News went online. And this is a newspaper that lost half a million people a year to death. So old was our readership profile. Um, but we were the first, first uh, company to mainstream newspaper to go online. At that time in the UK, the largest consumer ISP had 5,000 subscribers. Today, the UK leads the G20 with 10% of GDP accounted for by the internet. So, I mean, the UK has sort of taken a remarkable journey. Today, the Department of Education published a, co a consultation paper to say that from next September, the UK will be the only country in the G8 to make coding a part of the curriculum from age five up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and as I said, even just in our portfolio, there are four billion pounds mm -hmm. of revenue not valuation, uh, in 2012, 2013. So I actually think with a little bit more attitude, um, you know, we really can sort of harvest some of the innovation that goes on here. And if you look at some major sectors, look at entertainment. Three of the biggest new entertainment companies in the world, Supercell, King, and Rovio, are all from Europe. Between Supercell and King, that's 20% of the app store revenue. App store revenue. If you look at music, Spotify, SoundCloud, Songkick, Last FM, Shazam. I'm, all, I'm, you know, I'm talking about companies you know, who are, you know, have tens of millions of users. If you look at retail, ASOS, mm -hmm. Netaporte, billion in revenue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not, not market cap, revenue. If you look at financial services, you know, all sectors that you would expect a city like London and Europe to do well in, you know, we are global innovators. So I think, you know, I mean, when Daniel Day-Lewis wins three Oscars as, as a British actor playing an American president, <coughs> Irish, <laughs> Irish, Irish British. So you think? <laughs> See, there you go. <laughs> 
Oh, we still know the important <laughs> arguments here. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Linux, <laughs> Microsoft. Right. You think British entrepreneurs need more attitude? Or you British and European. I think, yeah, yeah, I would yeah. agree with that. So just on that point, um, monetize Alistair Lukies, who walks on water as far as I'm concerned, has created a billion-dollar mobile banking company. This is the difference, right? Is he on the cover of Wired magazine? No, we get Jack Dorsey, who I'm sure is a very nice guy, who's launched Square on the cover of Wired UK, to which I can only then call up the communications director of Monetize and say, we have a problem, right? <laughs> In this country, Monetize should be a freaking rock star, right? Maybe he doesn't, isn't a rock star in America yet. But in this country, what Monetize has done, they've bought their US competitor. They're backed by Visa. They've become a billion dollar company. If you're going to put somebody on the cover of Wired UK, please make sure it's the homegrown hero, not Jack Dorsey, right? There's something wrong with that. And I think Americans or people who work in Silicon Valley know how to claim victory. And we have to claim victory when we can. OK. <laughs> um, did you have anything to add on that point? Um, I think one of the biggest struggles, it's easy to make these statements, is B2C, entrepreneurs who run B2C companies are much more naturally uh, in a place where they can get PR. Um, and by its very nature, Europe has had a, a higher proportion of its startups based around B2B industries or enterprise solutions. And it's really hard for anybody to get excited about the Wired magazine or getting on the front of um, the sun or the mirror or just basically popularizing kind of what entrepreneurship represents. So I think it's very easy to say that we should be doing these things, but getting really excited about a new payment system is, is not really newsworthy or not for popular press. And I think until A, we recognize that, and or actually we concentrate our efforts on some of those more populistic characters and actually get them to stand up. Actually, there's a proportion of entrepreneurs out there who just like doing their job. They just don't want to get out there and do PR. Because if you're in a B2, if you're in a B2B business, actually getting into popular press doesn't really add much to the underlying value of your, your business. I want to disagree yeah, with too. that, if I can. <laughs> because actually, you know, one of the ways a CEO does their job is to increase the value of their business. And I think... Take Aaron Levy, for example, who, um, you know, we're investors in Dropbox, um, which, you know, I think is, is really probably doing much better, actually, in the enterprise than Aaron Levy and Box. But Aaron Levy has been masterful at selling his B2B story mm -hmm. to, you know, even in the UK, the government in the UK has a 16 billion pound IT budget. So I think, you know, whether you're selling to enterprise customers, whether you're selling, you know, fashion to consumers, um, you know, it is one of the responsibilities of a management team and a CEO to tell the story and to tell it well, because that increases value. Now, totally agree with you. That is not at, at, uh, at, at the... Uh, you know, to, to lack focus on product. If you don't have good product, if you're not executing, you know, you've got a real problem. But if you're not telling your story, if you're not telling your story as well as you can to the right people and increasing value, then you've got a real problem as well. So it's just to echo that, nine-tenths of the world's industry has not been remade by uh, data. Is, you know, software has not transformed it yet. Digital business models have not created new digital revenues for the big players in those industries. So that's the big opportunity, and that's B2B. And the enabling technologies and tools businesses are digital enablers mostly. The big opportunity is to go after that, right? So, you know, the Davids hopping on the back of Goliath and transforming them. So the venture community is really building the digital cars, and those cars need a highway. And there's one vision of the world whereby technology firms are just going to continue to take over more and more industries, Amazon books, um, Apple uh, music and telecoms, and, and so forth, 
or large enterprise can figure out how to open itself up and to be that highway for those digital cars. And there's massive opportunities there, and it is why there have been so many accelerators opening up and so forth. But the future is really clear. Either those large enterprises, either they figure that out fast, or no matter how much cash they have on their balance sheet, they're really in decline and they're going, you know, they're going out of business.